Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on laboratory water systems, necessary water specifications, and validation challenges. My name is Johnson, and I'm going to be your host for today's session. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you for being a part of today's event. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Terry C. Solly. Dr. Solly is a PhD microbiologist and president of Solly Pharma Solutions, Inc., and is a consultant serving consumer products and FDA-regulated industries with training and contamination troubleshooting expertise covering water systems, sterile and non-sterile products and processes, and microbiological laboratory operations. Prior to full-time consulting starting in 2004, he had 25 years of pharmaceutical operating company experience. He has lectured extensively at conferences and webinars, authored numerous papers, and written several books, chapters related to water system microbiology and biofilm control for USP, PDA, and ISPE publications. He is currently serving his third five-year term on USP expert committees responsible for pharmaceutical waters, during which he completely rewrote USP Chapter 1231, which many consider to be USP's pharmaceutical water bible. Now, we are honored to have such a distinguished person, such as Dr. Solly, with us to present today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to inform you of the program outlined for today's training session. This webinar is for 90 minutes duration. First, Dr. Solly will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. We'd like to inform all our participants once part of the teleconference have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A begins towards the end of the webinar. Now, this is done to avoid any kind of discontinuity and for allowing our presenter to speak clearly so that everyone present can take maximum benefit from this webinar. We request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of time is allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be answered. Now, for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we are ready to start, I request Dr. Solly to take it from here. Dr. Solly? Thank you, Johnson. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and, and either good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're sitting in right now. Um, we're going to be talking about laboratory water systems today uh, and defining what the necessary water specifications need to be for your water, as well as some of the challenges associated with trying to validate uh, these water systems. Uh, before I get into that, I just wanted to sort of uh, uh, emphasize a few things about my background. I am a consultant. Most, most of the things that I involve myself in are usually troubleshooting somebody else's contamination problems and coming up with uh, solutions. Uh, during my entire career, well, all but maybe three years of my career, uh, I was uh, involved with USP in one way or another. Uh, like Johnson has said, I'm in my third five-year term right now, which is due to expire in a couple of years, uh, probably re-up for another five-year term. Uh, but uh, right now, I'm on the USP Chemical Analysis Expert Committee, and that committee uh, is responsible for pharmaceutical water uh, in USP. Uh, prior to that, I served two terms on their uh, Pharmaceutical Water Expert Committee when they had that committee uh, during the two terms between 2000 and 2010. And even before that, I was involved uh, with a pharma water quality committee that helped USP as an advisory council for, for making the changes uh, to conductivity and TOC that uh, um, became official with USP 23 uh, back in 1996. So I've been involved uh, with water and, and industry committees for a very long period of time. Uh, but having said that, uh, and especially because of my involvement with USP, I just want to make it sure that, that you understand that I am not speaking for USP. I'm not representing USP today. I'm, I'm an unpaid volunteer. 
emphasis on unpaid, uh, working with USP. And so I am speaking as a private citizen, uh, and these are my own opinions uh, that you're going to hear today, although uh, where USP is not silent on these issues, you may find that my opinion and USP's opinion are very close. So at any rate, let's get into our presentation today. Um, this is a summary of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, like, for instance, the kind of water quality you really need for your laboratory systems, uh, the, those that are required and those that might perhaps be unnecessary, uh, some lab water supply options, how, how your laboratory is supplied with water has a lot to do uh, with, with your ability to control and, and meet the uh, requirements. Um, we're going to talk about some laboratory design issues, and of course we're going to get into uh, laboratory water system validation, whether it's even needed or not, uh, and uh, the point of being able to customize the attributes of importance for your water system. Uh, and then we're going to touch a little bit on packaged waters because packaged waters often are considered to be an option to having an on-site uh, distribution system for your laboratories. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the issues associated with that. So let's talk about lab water quality requirements. Well, if you're doing USP testing, uh, then the general notices in USP, uh, which is at the front of the book, uh, specifies that USP purified water is the minimum water quality that you must have. You may have higher purity than that, but you must not uh, be using for, for, for these tests uh, any water purity that is less than that. Now that doesn't say that you can't wash, you know, labware, you know, starting off with potable water, but you have to finish off by rinsing it with purified water. Um, and this also applies to really all pharmacopoeia. Uh, each pharmacopoeia, if you're doing tests from those pharmacopoeia, uh, require that you be using at least the purified water quality of that pharmacopoeia. Now that may bring in some issues because if you're doing EP tests, for instance, uh, you have to meet the EP purified water requirements, and those are different than USPs. Um, now, you may actually have some analyses that require higher chemical purity, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and um, some of those are, are required because of the nature of the assay. Uh, if you have HPLC or ion chromatography or ICP or maybe some trace LCM, SMS assays, and even enzyme or cell assays, you may need to have water of higher purity, a specific absence of certain uh, particular types of chemicals, for instance, uh, in order to perform those tests. This, this would be water quality in excess of the, of the purified water quality, uh, but these are things that usually, for the analysts who are running these tests, they're very well aware of what the purity is that they need. Uh, but sometimes it's because you're running tests that are not USP tests. Maybe you're running ISO tests or ASTM tests or maybe CLSI tests. Uh, and as it turns out, these uh, standard setting organizations have their own waters, uh, go figure. Uh, and when they have their own waters, they have their own specifications. Now, in most cases, if you're meeting uh, the requirements of, of USP purified water, you will meet most of these. However, it should point out that some, for instance, ASTM tests do actually have a micro requirement. Uh, some, some of the, the types of water, that's type 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we'll get into what, what the differences are uh, with these different waters, but just be aware that if you're running tests that are associated with CLSI, ASTM, or ISO, uh, there are different waters that are specified for use in those assays. Um, sometimes um, uh, your regulations may uh, require ultra high purity water being used uh, for the nature of some tests. You may need to have some high resistivity or ultra low TOC or, or ultra low endotoxin, for instance, uh, if you're running an endotoxin test, uh, you know, you've got to have an absence of endotoxin in the water uh, and so forth. And so it depends upon uh, the, those regulations uh, that are listed above and uh, the test requirements as to what specific additional attributes uh, need to be listed for your water. Now, this is a pretty busy table. Uh, it's a compendial water requirements for Europe, Japan, and the U.S. Um, and most of these uh, issues are very well known to the users, but there is a uh, 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 an addition that have, has occurred. The Japanese Pharmacopoeia 16 
uh, just last year finally officially adopted conductivity in TOC for their monographs. Uh, prior to that point in time, uh, they still had their wet chem tests that were uh, specified in their monographs. Uh, so they finally dropped their wet chem test and have adopted the conductivity. And it's sort of a version of the conductivity that, that USP has. Uh, of course, if you're familiar with USP conductivity, there's three stages of the test. Um, and uh, the stage one part of the test is an online reading. Um, and there's a table, a lookup table, depending upon the temperature of the water, because you can't use a temperature compensated probe or instrument for the conductivity. You have to use an uncompensated uh, instrument. And uh, and so there's a number, uh, an array of 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 values that you have to meet depending upon what temperature the water happens to be. If it's 25 degrees, uh, it's 1.3 microsiemens per centimeter. Uh, now. Uh, European Pharmacopeia, let me jump across the table to the yellow part. The European Pharmacopeia uh, has three waters, purified water, water for injections, and highly purified water. <clears throat> now, their water for injections and their highly purified water follow almost identically uh, what USP has for its waters. Uh, however, their purified water has looser conductivity specs. Uh, and they also have the option of running the old oxidizable substance test in lieu of a TOC test. Uh, so, so, so there are differences in European pharmacopoeia. But basically, if you meet USP uh, purified water requirements, you will meet the European pharmacopoeia uh, purified water requirements. Now, there are a couple of extra tests that are required in European pharmacopoeia for nitrates uh, and for heavy metals. Uh, and these are tests that, that uh, are historical. Uh, they're legacy tests. They have always had them. They did not drop those wet chem tests when they adopted uh, the conductivity and, and TOC attributes. Um, but basically, you can't fail them if you pass your conductivity, but still you've got to test them anyway. Now, the uh, European Pharmacopeia does allow that if you do meet the conductivity requirements of their water for injections, which is USP's requirement for both purified water and water for injection, uh, then you don't have to run the heavy metals test because uh, they have studies, uh, and, and we know of those studies, that, that preclude the ability of, of heavy metals to be present in enough uh, levels to actually fail the heavy metals test. However, if you have that looser conductivity purified water, uh, you do have to run the heavy metals test in addition to the nitrates test. Now, we also listen, list things relative to aluminum and endotoxins, uh, and that is when the waters wind up being used uh, for a hemodialysis solution uh, preparations. Uh, and in those cases, uh, you would also have to have an aluminum specification as well as a bacterial endotoxin specification, even for the purified water. USP has a separate monograph for water for hemodialysis, and so it doesn't have that distinction. So this is really sort of uh, two sets of monographs in one uh, because it does include, uh, in, in essence, the water that's used for hemodialysis solution prep uh, in the European pharmacopoeia. Uh, and so you can look at those and you say, oh, okay, I can see the differences. Um, Japanese pharmacopoeia, uh, deals with conductivity a little bit differently. Uh, its monographs are intended purely for offline testing, so online testing is not an allowance in the monograph. Uh, and if you do the offline test, the stage two specification uh, is 2.1 microsiemens per centimeter. And that's the same as the stage two test for, for in the U.S. pharmacopoeia for purified water and water for injection. So it's the same. Uh, if you go to their general information chapter, it talks about online testing uh, and describes the fact that you can qualify your online testing to be uh, a replacement for and just as good as offline testing from, from use point grad samples. Um, and in that informational chapter, it gives the same chart uh, as is found in, in the USP uh, test chapter 645 for conductivity. So it's so it's basically the same. Uh, the difference is that the Japanese pharmacopoeia does not have a stage three option, and that's where you test the pH in addition to the conductivity. Um, usually that option uh, is, is rarely exercised, even in the US. 
but it is <clears throat> certainly an option that is available uh, in the U.S., but not in Japan. Uh, now, one other sort of, it's, it's a picky point, I have to admit that, <clears throat> and it has to do with significant figures. Uh, there are differences in the TOC test across uh, across the chart there. Uh, in USP, uh, a lot of people perceive the specification as being 500 parts per billion uh, for TOC. Uh, in actuality, it's not. Uh, what it is is the instrument's response to a 0 0.50 milligram per liter standard of a sucrose solution. And so uh, it's sort of a one-point calibration. If your instrument gives you, you know, uh, 520 parts per billion for that solution, then the spec uh, for the water happens to be 520. Um, but there's a significant figure issue. And notice that in the um, limit for TOC, uh, you see in the Japanese pharmacopoeia, 0.50. Uh, and in USP, you see 0 0.50. But if you look over in European farm, it says 0.5. Now, that, that creates a significant figure issue. Uh, and so in actuality, uh, in the European pharmacopoeia, you could have uh, as high as 549 ppb uh, and still pass because of the significant figure rounding issues. Uh, but in, in USP and JP, uh, you could have only as high as 504, 504 parts per billion and still pass the test. So you, so you could basically pass uh, EP and fail, uh, fail USP or JP uh, when it comes to TOC. Um, that's a rare occurrence because almost nobody runs at around 500 for their TOCs. Almost everybody on the planet with a decent water system runs uh, a tenth of that, 50 or less. Uh, and so it usually is not, not a point that winds up being exercised, uh, but I just wanted to point that out as a difference between uh, the three sets of pharmacopoeial standards for their waters. Of course, there is a major difference in how uh, water for injections is allowed to be prepared in Europe. Uh, they only accept distillation. Uh, but if you look at the Japanese pharmacopoeia, it could be distillation or it could be a combination of unit operations involving RO, UF, deionization, uh, or whatever. Uh, in the U.S. pharmacopoeia, it basically says distillation or process that is equivalent in the elimination of microbial and chemical contaminants. Uh, and so you, are, you do have the allowance in USP and more or less the allowance in JP to use whatever works to generate uh, the water quality called water for injection. Uh, but in Europe, uh, it's obligatory distillation. Uh, the bottom line across the world is almost everybody uses distillation. Uh, but certainly, if you have products that are not being shipped to Europe, uh, you could use other unit operations rather than distillation uh, in the U.S. So are there other compendial waters beside these? Well, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of analytical waters that are specified in test chapters and monographs and, and even in general notices in the reagent sections of USP uh, that are not the compendial waters. They are used primarily in analyses of one sort or another. And these are generally legacy, uh, legacy waters that most of them, or at least more, well, half at least, uh, actually uh, were created uh, or, or sort of translated and carried over from, from monographs and chapters and whatnot that existed prior to 1996. In 1996, that was when the purified water and water for injection monographs changed to having conductivity in TOC. Um, and when they did that, they finally uh, instituted meaningful attributes uh, in, in those, those two monographs. They were meaningful, they were quantitative, you could tell if you passed or failed. Um, and this is compared to the tests that they had prior to that, which were wet chem tests for things like chloride and calcium and ammonia and things like that. Uh, and basically those tests <clears throat> were primarily designed to tell the user that the water that they had there uh, was not the starting water or, or only partially purified water because they were picking up the ions that would be 
uh, present uh, as carryover ions in an incompletely uh, purified potable water situation. Uh, and so they didn't actually mean much. They weren't quantitative. They were pass-fail tests looking for a color to develop or not or a color to disappear or not or turbidity to develop or not. Uh, and so they, they didn't really give you any kind of quantitative feel for how pure your water was. And that changed when USP instituted conductivity and TOC. Well, whenever some of these test chapters were created prior to the time of TOC and conductivity, you know, quantitative purity measurements were not part of the monograph. Uh, and that's why a lot of the waters that had been created, uh, that, that's why they were, that's why they originated. Uh, and it's, it's peculiar because many of them were defined by how they were produced. Uh, and they would give instructions or, or some adjectives that would be associated with how the waters uh, are produced. And uh, some examples would be uh, CO2 free water. Now that tells you that it's free from carbon dioxide, but there were some instructions on how to produce it. Uh, actually, found in the reagent section that said, you know, you can vigorously boil water for five minutes and protect it from CO2 while cooling. Uh, and so that tends to drive off most of the CO2 out of the water because you heat it up, and gases, of course, are less soluble in, in hot water than they are in cold. And so you drive off uh, the vast majority, but not all. So it actually isn't CO2-free. Uh, it's just really reduced CO2 water. Uh, or there's deaerated water. Sometimes deaerated waters are required for a dissolution test and things like that. And, and it basically says you can do it by boiling or sonication or vacuum filtration and stirring. And so it gives you processes that you can use for generating that particular water. Now, it also, uh, with some adjectives, tell you how you produce it. There's distilled water, freshly distilled water, filtered distilled water, deionized distilled water, freshly deionized water. All of these have implications as to the uh, chemical quality of the water uh, with all of these adjectives that are put in front of the word water. Um, some of these specified non-compendial or non-monographed waters, they are compendial, uh, have sort of rudimentary attributes that are ascribed to them in other parts of USP. For instance, high purity water, and it's important that it's high hyphen purity water because there is actually a high purity water without a hyphen someplace else in USP, believe it or not. Uh, and it's specified as having a, a, a conductivity of point one five microsiemens per centimeter, and that that equates to about six point six six megohms. Uh, and so, uh, you might question why six point six six and not eighteen. Uh, well, there's actually a practical reason. Once you grab a water sample and fill a beaker with eighteen megohm water, and you determine what the what the conductivity is. That conductivity is almost immediately degraded by the presence of CO2 in the air to, guess what, about 0.15 microsiemens per centimeter. Uh, and so it's really sort of a, a practical term uh, for high purity water. You, you collect it from an ultra high purity water system, and after you've collected it, it's only high purity. Uh, then there's filtered water, uh, and this describes uh, that it has porosity, filtered with something with porosity of 0.15 depending upon the application, between 1.2 and 0.2 micron filters uh, are specified. And so the implication to that is that there are no particles in there that, that are um, higher than those particular specifications. Um, and so there's an implied specification by doing that. And also one of the ways of preparing CO2-free water uh, an alternative definition is water that is not less than 18 megohm centimeters. Now, the reason that that's considered CO2 free is because when CO2 dissolves in water, it, it equilibrates with a bicarbonate ion. And so some of it exists as dissolved gas and some of it exists as, as a bicarbonate ion. So if you pull out the ions, um, what happens is the remaining portion that is gas then will re equilibrate to a portion of it being an ion. And ultimately, you can scrub the CO2 out of the water by basically generating 18 megohm water, which has no bicarbonate, which means no CO2 dissolved in it. And so it's an alternative way of preparing CO2-free water. Uh, let me make sure this thing works now. Okay. 
So it also may be defined by the absence of some substance that could interfere with a particular test. Uh, for instance, uh, there is oxygen-free water defined, organic-free water, lead-free water, chloride-free water. As you can sort of imagine, you can look at those, uh, uh, those descriptions and sort of guess what test it's for. For instance, lead-free might be for a lead test, and chloride-free might be for a chloride test. Uh, oxygen-free is probably for a test that is um, where oxygen would interact with one or more of the analytes or, or reagents that are used in the test. Uh, and so oxygen-free water is specified. Organic-free water, for instance, is what is specified uh, if you're running the residual solvents test because you don't want to have organics in your water uh, then creating peaks or whatever in, in your GC uh, chromatograms when you run that particular test. It also uh, has a few waters that are defined by specific use. For instance, there's water for BET, which is bacterial endotoxin test. And this was formerly called uh, the, the LAL reagent water or LRW water, but now it's been renamed to water for BET. And also you'll find listed in several places uh, HPLC grade water, whatever that is. Uh, we've been struggling to try to figure out what in the world that, that purity is. And because we struggle to understand what the actual purity of some of these named waters is, uh, this is a focus of attention by, by the USB expert committee that I'm on right now. And we are in the process of trying to uh, reconcile some of these what we call mongrel waters uh, because of, of the way that they are uh, poorly described or really undefined. Um, we're finding, uh, done a preliminary scan of the 300-ish uh, locations in USP where these waters are of one sort or another are mentioned. Uh, and it looks like probably about three-quarters of them could be just replaced by what we now call purified water with the conductivity and TOC specs as they exist today. Uh, but it depends upon the analytical application as to whether or not that is appropriate. There's at least a quarter of them, maybe more, that we know that that would not work for uh, because of the absence of some uh, chemical or, or the presence of, of some chemical that, that is not specified in the purified water monograph. Uh, now, there, uh, there was a, a stimuli article that was published uh, back in PF 37.2, uh, and inscribed a way of, of possibly categorizing the classes of contaminants and their levels. Uh, and you see this, this I-O-B-E-Z-G-P. Uh, those letters stand for I, meaning ionic or conductive things, O meaning organic or TOC things, B being bacterial, E being endotoxin, Z being enzymes of some sort or another, G being gases, and P being particulates. Now, this is a way that we could have of sort of uh, unifying uh, a consistent uh, lexicon for defining waters. We're, we're not sure we're going to go that way uh, because we're not sure that there's enough uh, variability in, in these attributes uh, of the various waters that are not substitutable by purified water uh, to be able to call up such a complicated plan. But it is one that's on the table, and we are yet to consider it. Uh, but these, these are changes that are yet to come uh, in USP. This is a little forewarning that we're probably going to be getting rid of a lot of these uh, uh, mongrel waters and just replacing it with plain old ordinary purified water. Now, this is an interesting but busy table, and I don't want you to necessarily gloss over it because these are the non-compendial waters, the non uh, non-USP, non-EP, non-JP waters that could be tested uh, or could be used in a laboratory for tests, uh, for ISO tests, for ASTM tests, and for CLSI tests. And I, I talked about those a little bit earlier. If you look across uh, the lines there, you're going to see that some have pH specifications, some don't. Uh, some have conductivity specifications, and they vary depending upon the grade or type of water that is there. Uh, and you can see the varying conductivities and varying uh, or and or resistivities, uh, equivalent resistivity, which is just the reciprocal of the conductivity. Um, in some cases, the, the conductivity measurement device uh, is allowed to be temperature compensated, and in other cases, 
Well, actually, in most cases, it, it does allow temperature compensation, which USP thinks is a big mistake because there's tons and tons of different comp compensation algorithms, and they are different depending upon the instrument that you buy. And so you won't necessarily get the same reading of the same water with two different instruments. Uh, you're going to see that TOC is listed on some of these waters, but not on others. Uh, oxidizable substances is still uh, listed on some of the ISO waters, uh, but not on any of the ASTM or CLSI waters. Um, and you, you can look, look across and you can see the list of attributes, uh, even specific attributes like silica and sodium, for instance. Uh, have specific limits uh, when you're talking about some of the ASTM waters. Um, interestingly, some of these waters, not ISO, but uh, uh, ASTM and, and CLSI waters, also have micro specifications that, that are required specifications. Now, in, in the ASTM D1193 uh, waters, uh, you see type A, B, and C, uh, and these are or a, a gradation of different microbial expectation levels uh, for the different types of water. Um, and those A, B, and C types carry through with uh, through the bacterial endotoxin limits as well. Uh, and so you can see that if you specify ASTM type 1 water, uh, you haven't done the full specifications because you need to say, is, is it type 1A uh, or type 1B or type 1C? Uh, and so, uh, obviously, you see a variety of, of specifications of all of these non-pharmacopoeal waters uh, that could be actually required to be used uh, in your laboratory. Now, let's talk about perhaps unnecessary um, water quality requirements that you may impose upon the laboratory water system. Do you truly need to have ultra-pure water in your laboratory? Um, very often laboratories that have that uh, have it because there's been an overly conservative decision made. Uh, very often it's um, an impulsive judgment uh, because uh, when, when a laboratory supervisor was asked, well, what kind of quality water do you need for your new laboratory and your new water system that you're going to have installed in your new laboratory? They sometimes knee-jerk uh, themselves and say, well, you know, if I have 18 megohm water, uh, then it doesn't matter what application I have, it's going to be pure enough. And so it's, it's sort of a, a, an easy uh, decision to make, but, but actually a very costly decision to make. Um, it is very expensive uh, to not only produce but maintain consistently something that you might call um, um, high purity water. Uh, and, be, and because of that, Hang on, let me just shut my phone off there. Uh, because of that, uh, it's um, uh, perhaps an inappropriate thing. Uh, and, and, and a thing that makes it really sort of inappropriate is the fact that CO2, which is in the air all around us, uh, degrades uh, the water as soon as it's dispensed from an 18 megohm uh, distribution system or from a laboratory or wall-mounted unit. Uh, and as soon as it hits the air, the CO2 starts changing the resistivity, dropping it dramatically. Uh, and so you may have 18 megohm water within the system, uh, but as soon as you get it out of the system, it's not 18 anymore. Uh, also, with ultra-pure water, typically there are t TOC expectations, uh, usually very, very low TOC expectations. Uh, and when there's very low TOC expectations, those are very, very difficult to achieve in a consistent manner because usually it's a polishing effort that, that manages to get the TOC levels down to single digits uh, and usually is not produced at the single digits. Often it's, it's low double digits where it's produced, but if you have a single digit uh, specification, it's very difficult to consistently maintain that quality water. Now, the microelectronics business has been doing this for years and years and years, uh, and that's because that's what they need uh, for manufacturing their uh, microelectronic chips and whatnot. Uh, and they spend lots and lots of money in order to maintain that quality consistently. Um, but I'm just trying to tell you, you know, don't necessarily specify that quality if you, if you really don't need to have it. 
what about the micro content for your laboratory water? Do you really need to control the micro content? Now, we do know that it is necessary for manufacturing uh, because it is a regulatory expectation, but it is not specified in USP. Uh, do you actually need a microbial specification for your laboratory water? Uh, actually, microbial control in laboratory water systems is sometimes quite difficult. I mean, quite difficult, uh, and for a lot of reasons that we'll describe shortly. Uh, but frankly, most of the tests in, in, a, in a pharmaceutical laboratory, and most laboratories in general, do not require microbial control because the microbial attribute has absolutely nothing to do with the usability of the water in the test. Um, it is intentionally not in the USP monograph. Uh, it wasn't an accidental oversight that it wasn't in there. It's intentionally in there, and it's to allow this very kind of situation to occur. There are situations where the microbial attribute is not important. Uh, and the laboratory is usually one of those places where it is not important. So why have a specification for micro if you really don't need it, and especially if the system was never really properly designed to maintain the microbial quality to begin with? <clears throat> um, you do have to verify the suitability uh, of, an, of, an, of not having a micro spec. Uh, and the reason basically is that you're dealing with people who have this paradigm that the microbial specification is required if it's purified water. Uh, and so it's, it's an exercise, it's probably a one-time exercise, where you evaluate all of the uses of water uh, in a laboratory for every reagent that's used, and you can justify, albeit even on paper, uh, whether or not there's any risk associated with microbial contamination uh, of the levels that you might expect to have in a water system uh, from actually uh, interfering with a test. Remember, these tests all have controls uh, that, that basically usually already involve the water, so if there is, is some sort of attribute from the microbial contamination in the water, it's going to show up in the control as well uh, and either be subtracted out of the response or at least highlighted as being problematic so that you wouldn't necessarily use the data. So, uh, so keep that in mind uh, when you're doing your assessment to justify not having a microbial spec for your laboratory purified water. However, if that is the case, and you can justify that, and almost every laboratory can, you need to have a separate specification in your company uh, for laboratory purified water because chances are the purified water spec that you have in your company has a micro spec in it. Uh, and so you do not want to have and refer to that specification for your laboratory water because that would then obligate you to having a microbial control program for your purified water system that you don't really need to have. Uh, so a separate written specification that you refer to is an essential element. So let's talk about uh, lab water uh, supply options. You know, how do you get water to a laboratory? Uh, well, sometimes, and I've seen this a few times, it doesn't happen a lot, uh, but I've seen outlets from production's purified water system actually in the laboratory. Uh, and it's by the proper design, they, they, they very much resemble the, the production outlet's points of use uh, in, the, in the nature of the outlet and, and how, it's, uh, you know, how it's plumbed and whatnot. Probably it's associated with a very well-designed loop. Uh, the valves are of, of the sanitary kind. Uh, but there are some concerns that uh, you can bet that, that, that production has, uh, and that is that you can misuse the water or misconnect the water uh, for a use uh, in a laboratory, and that could affect the entire production water supply. You can get backflow of contaminants. Uh, from, uh, for instance, a dishwasher. Uh, you can get good old Alkanox, you know, into your purified water system if, if you have just the right set of conditions because very often washers and things like that are, are hard piped or hard plumbed uh, into, uh, into these pieces of equipment, and, and that hard plumbed connection is always open. Uh, and so you have, in essence, a dead leg. Uh, also, you can have misuse from overuse of water. Uh, how many times have 
uh, has has the laboratory water system drain the tank uh, when someone hooked up a pipette washer uh, at the end of the day and went home for the day and the thing ran all night long uh, and just used lots and lots of gallons of water, uh, more so than perhaps could even be made up for uh, by the generation system. So there are risks associated with having uh, uh, production purified water systems with lab outlets. Uh, and so if that is the case, uh, these kinds of situations need to be very well controlled so they don't affect production's quality of water. Uh, more often than not, there's a dedicated central lab uh, distribution system. Uh, it's, it's for the laboratory. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's usually situated somewhere very near the laboratory, often in a closet uh, off of, off of a, a, one of the labs. Uh, there are questions and issues associated with who's responsible for maintaining the system. Uh, chances are the laboratory water system is designed to slightly lower standards uh, than would be a manufacturing water system, which sometimes creates problems relative to microbial control if that happens to be required. Uh, you could also have in the laboratory uh, these bench top or wall mounted uh, types of purification systems are made by a number of vendors, but I'll just call them the milliq type of system. Um, and often this is a type of water uh, that is available in laboratories. There are some operational issues with these that, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, as well as some issues associated with compendial requirements of verifying that they do indeed meet uh, purified water uh, requirements. And then, of course, there's the packaged waters. Now, the packaged waters could be for very specific uses, or, or, or it could be for general lab use. Um, but there are issues associated with packaged waters, and usually they have to do with extractables or leachables coming from the packaging itself. Uh, and frankly, these levels change over the shelf life of the product, generally increasing over time. Uh, and so there are issues with other things being in the water uh, that could affect the uses. Uh, more than likely, what you're dealing with is a combination of, of one, two, or three uh, of these particular possible supply options uh, in your laboratory. And each of them have their own issues, and each of them, quite frankly, need to have decisions relative to validation. So let's talk about some lab water design issues. Um, <clears throat> this happens typically when a lab water system is being created along with a new laboratory, often in a new building. Uh, the availability of the outlets. Um, sometimes a, sort of a knee-jerk uh, decision is made uh, to make sure that every lab has got some uh, purified water outlet available to it, often multiple ones. You'll often find every sink plumbed with, a, with, a, with this uh, purified water as well as potable water. Um, but you got to be careful. Uh, because every time you have one uh, located, it becomes a maintenance issue. It has to be something that you have to, to watch because you could have problems at given outlets that could uh, cause problems in the whole system. Uh, and if you have too many outlets, including outlets in places where they're never used, uh, then these unused and unflushed outlets become sources of of problems, chemical and even microbial contamination that could affect uh, the rest of the water system, uh, assuming, of course, that you have microbial attributes in your water system. You certainly have chemical attributes for your water system. Then you had the other is other issue of having only a few outlets, you know, and you lo locate them where they're frequently used. But you know, then you have now the issue of of if you happen to need that water in a location that's not at that outlet then analysts often will uh, uh, take, you know, water and, and transport it uh, uh, to different locations uh, throughout the system. And, and when that happens, now you've got uh, issues associated with uh, uh, what happens to the water when it's in the carboy and how long is it in the carboy. And is there anything extracting chemically out of the carboy that's going to affect its POC values? Uh, so, you know, they become issues uh, that, you know, is the other side of the coin. You can have too many. You can probably also have too few. Um, so it's something that you need to have a balance of. What about the design of the distribution systems? Um, 
often the designers of a laboratory water system are different than those that are used for designing manufacturing water systems. Um, very often, if you do happen to need microbial control, there are unsanitary designs, uh, very common, uh, in, in laboratory water systems. And so if you happen to need microbial control, well, you're just plain out of luck because a lot of these uh, uh, branched systems, um, uh, uh, dead legs everywhere, you know, a lot of these things are just nightmares to control microbiologically. Uh, so that's one reason why if you don't need to have microbial control and you don't need micro specs, for heaven's sakes, please don't obligate yourself to them because it is very, very difficult with these often uh, poorly designed water systems, uh, poorly designed for microbial control types of water systems. And there's some issues that are described there uh, that are gotchas almost every time. Uh, gooseneck sink outlets, um, uh, hard piped equipment connections, which function as dead legs. Um, and often they use cheaper piping in unit operations, non-sanitary fittings, all kinds of uh, poor construction approaches that, that make for crevices and all kinds of things. Uh, and so you're, you've, you've got sort of a nightmare on your hands uh, if you need microbial control uh, in a laboratory system in many cases. What are some of the operational issues? I sort of referred to it before, but uh, if you've got a central distributed system for your laboratory, who's in charge of it? Who's supposed to maintain it? Do they have the water system understanding and the expertise to be able to do that, or are they just some poor low-level technician that's assigned uh, to that to be? That's his job or her job. Um, whose cost center is responsible for maintaining it? I mean, if it's your cost center, it's your baby. Uh, but, but, you know, make sure there's an understanding, especially if you're constructing a water system with a central or constructing a laboratory with a central water system, make sure it's clear. It's always best to have the folks who are maintaining the manufacturing water system to be the ones who also maintain the laboratory water system because they know what they're doing, they know what to look for, and very often a, a low-level technician doesn't have a clue. Now they're looking for the resistivity light to be on or off or, or, or some other alarm to be flashing or whatever to help them, and very often systems don't have those little crutches. Um, so anyway... Um, Remember that even if it is assigned uh, to the people who maintain the manufacturing water systems, you know, it's their job to maintain it, uh, it may be of secondary importance to them. Uh, their primary importance is, of course, the manufacturing water system. And so if it's of secondary importance, then, you know, if there's ever any issues associated with the lab water system that need maintenance, sometimes, you know, it's going to be one of those, well, we'll get around to it sooner or later. Uh, and in the meantime, you have non-compliant water, uh, and that's because it's not an urgency on their part. Uh, sometimes uh, when the responsibility is, is ambiguous and it's not certain who is actually supposed to be maintaining it, uh, with that amb ambiguity comes uh, usually poor, poor quality. You'll have situations where qu poor quality is, is a factor, and then that could then affect the usability of that water. Now, when you've got bench top units uh, or these wall mounted types of, like I call them, milli Q types of uh, purification systems, uh, they very often have online resistivity with them because they're usually making high purity water, often 18 or 18.2 meg ohm water. Uh, but one thing that you have to understand that that's one half of the attributes that are important for purified water. What about TOC? Very often, these benchtop types of units don't have a TOC instrument, and there's a good reason for it. The TOC instrument, especially an online instrument, is going to cost probably more than the water system cost by itself. And so it's uh, very unlikely for some of these benchtop types of things to actually have any TOC monitoring at all. And it's strictly related to grab sample uh, types of testing where you take take a TOC sample over to a laboratory TOC instrument someplace, probably in the chemistry lab, uh, plug it in and find out the TOC, but that's not online. Uh, that's grab sample types of stuff. 
uh, and also the, the resistivity instrument that's in there is probably temperature compensated, and that means it's not compatible with USP. Uh, it may or may not have a certified um, a cell constant for the probe. You may not even be able to get to the instrument to 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 qualify uh, or do a calibration on the electronics of of the of the conductivity or resistivity instrument. And so, very often, the the resistivity measurement that's made by the instrument is not USP compatible. Now, the the hope here is that you know if it is off, uh, it would have to be way off for you to fail. Uh, the USB conductivity specification, especially if you have a, a high purity water system that's you know 18-ish megohms, even if it was off by 50%, and it really wasn't 18 megohms, it was really 9 megohms, you're still well passing the USB purified water conductivity requirement. However, the absence of TOC testing is, uh, or the absence of online TOC. Uh, is is a possible issue with these systems, and we'll we'll deal with that when we talk about validation. Um, sometimes it's got microbial control uh, built into it. It's got a filter or a little UV light or something like that built into uh, built into the actual uh, instrumentation inside the black box of of this purity high purity water system. Is it working? How do you know? Do you ever do a micro test on it? Uh, at what point do you change out the filter or change out the bulb or UV bulb or whatever? Uh, you know, if it's got something that you say must work, you have to verify that it does work. Um, if it's inconsequential to you, please don't say anything about it. <laughs> because if you do say something about it, you have to verify it's doing what it says it's doing. Um, sometimes the way these things operate is, is a problem. Very often with these benchtop models, you operate them to the point of exhaustion. And when it gets to the point of exhaustion where you have to replace a module because the green light goes red or, or whatever, and it, it's because the resistivity has gone to pot, you know. Uh, and so now you have basically very impure water coming out of the system. Now, these units that are, op that are intended to be operated to the point of failure uh, are intended to be noticed, and then the module replaced, and then now you've got good water again. But what if you happen to be using the water at the time that that happens, or you don't notice uh, that the resistivity uh, gauge is is reading, you know, 0.1 megohms, uh, which means it's well non-compliant uh, with uh, the purified water specifications, because 0.1 megohms means 10 microsiemens, and we know that fails uh, conductivity specifications for USB purified water. It could happen, uh, and so. Uh, the modular replacement and the observation of the conductivity or resistivity at the time the water is used is a very important thing to be proceduralized um, uh, and make sure that every person in the lab is responsible for being able to check that and, and does check it uh, every time they draw water out of one of those things. Okay. Remember that you're not monitoring TOC. You're only monitoring conductivity. Do you know if the conductivity, uh, while it's still passing, do you know if your TOC is still passing? Since you're not monitoring it, uh, that's something that is an issue basically for validation uh, to verify that, that your conductivity is always, your, that your resistivity is always, excuse me, that your TOC is always passing whenever your resistivity is passing. Uh, and that's something that needs to be verified, perhaps, during the validation of a unit, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, like right now. So, does a lab water system need to be validated? Well, actually, it's a tough question that actually has a pretty simple set of answers. The answer is yes, it does need to be validated if you ever assume that you are meeting the USP quality water without constantly evaluating the compliance with that water as you're using it, verifying it very frequently or with every use of the water. If you do verify it with every use of the water, then you really don't have to validate it. But remember, there is that attribute called TOC, which you are probably not verifying with every use of the water because of the cost of the instrumentation. Um, now, if you... Um, if you do verify it, 
you know, every time you use it, you don't have to qualify it. If you assume that it is uh, meeting the, the specifications, then you do have to qualify or validate it. Uh, and remember that TOC attribute is, is the wild card there. And so very few of these instruments, the, excuse me, these the pieces of, of lab uh, water purification systems, uh, very few of them actually have online TOC. The big units that cost thousands and thousands of dollars may sometimes have a TOC, online TOC instrument associated with them. Uh, but the small bench top ones uh, almost never do. And so that TOC attribute is something that is uh, important to qualify. The, the bottom line here is that you have a ne unique opportunity with your lab purified water system to customize uh, the validation of the system to exactly the attributes that are important to you. Um, you do not want to use, uh, for your laboratory purified water system, you do not want to use the manufacturing template for for manufacturing's purified water system. Uh, and that's because it, it may contain an irrelevant attribute, like micro, uh, just for instance. Uh, you may need to have a tighter attribute, like 18 plus mega ohm. Uh, and so it would be ridiculous for you to use their protocol uh, for your water system when you have different attributes uh, than they have. So. Uh, remember that you should never, ever try to validate your water system to prove that it meets some sort of attributes that it was never designed to deliver. <clears throat> and, and this is a source of great frustration. Uh, like, for instance, if you have uh, a really poorly designed lab water system and you do have microbial control requirements, uh, that means that you've got microbial control that has to be done to a water system that is so poorly designed that it can't be accomplished. Um, and you'll, you'll be very frustrated when you, when you fail, and it's new to no fault of your own. It's just a system that can't be sanitized. <clears throat> there was some wisdom that occurred uh, back in the early years of our country, back in the 1700s, and Ben Franklin is, is notorious uh, f uh, for this wisdom uh, in his writings of Poor Richard's Almanac. And he had one saying is you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. In other words, you can't, by, by wishing it to be so or by testing it to be so, you can't make a water system uh, meet microbial requirements when it was never designed to be microbially controlled. Uh, that's basically what that says. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, lab validation some more. You need to focus your validation requirements on the attributes that are important for your lab water system. And chances are, these are very different from what manufacturing's water systems are. Uh, if it needs microbial control, truly needs it, then microbial control becomes an element. Uh, and then perhaps uh, the water system validation uh, resembles a bit uh, what, the, uh, what the purified water system validation will be. Remember that, that how you use the water uh, is very important. So hoses, just like in a manufacturing water system, hoses will be important to a laboratory water system. Uh, if you have no microbial specs, then hoses are inconsequential. Um, the duration of your laboratory water system validation will probably be akin to the duration of a manufacturing water system validation. Uh, and that's because that length of, of that validation is usually associated with the microbial attribute because it takes time for biofilm to develop and it takes time for bio, biofilm to get out of control. Uh, <clears throat> you don't see it in a, in a short term, you see it in the long term. And that's why the manufacturer uh, validation programs for their water systems are, are last so long. Um, if you do not need microbial control and you do not have a microbial specification, then that means that you're just worried about the chemical specifications. And if you're worried about chemical specifications, then you, you craft your validation around the chemical specs. Uh, and the, the, the lead time associated with chemical changes in a water system when something goes wrong could be a much, much shorter period of time. And usually you control this with proactive replacement of units and things like that, a proactive replacement of, of uh, DI beds and, and RO membranes and carbon beds and you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so if you do that, then uh, 
chances are the validation period uh, for your water system sans microbiological requirements is going to be much shorter. Now, what if you use ultra-pure water? If you need ultra-pure water, and, and I'm recommending that you try not to lock yourself into that if you don't need to, but if you do truly need it, um, it's probably, you know, your little benchtop things are probably going to be able to deliver 18 megohm water. Well, I shouldn't say that. They'll have 18 megohm water in it, and as soon as it tries to deliver it, it will be compromised by uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere. And so that 18 megohm can only be proven uh, with grab sample testing uh, if, uh, if you somehow exclude CO2 from getting into your sample when you draw the sample. Now, it's not that hard to do if you have like a portable um, uh, flow-through cell that you can hook up to the outlet so you're actually independently verifying perhaps with a USB compliant instrument. Uh, that indeed the resistivity is as uh, high and the conductivity is as low as as, as the onboard instrument says it is, because really you're, you're quite frankly validating the onboard instrumentation. Um, but if CO2 has a chance to see that sample at all, you will never be able to duplicate that inline reading. Uh, and if you can't duplicate the inline reading, then how do you know it's accurate? So it sort of compromises your ability to qualify. Uh, a system like that uh, relative to conductivity. Uh, and then, of course, there's that TOC thing that we talked about. Uh, but the bottom line here, and I've been talking about bottom lines right and, right and left here, uh, is you don't create a specification for a purity that you don't need. Uh, and especially if all you can do to verify the, the resistivity of your 18 megohm system is a grab sample, uh, then you're doomed to failure. Um, and don't forget about that TOC. Remember, you've got to verify that it's still compliant um, at the point that you have a, a point of, of, of maintenance or point of failure of, of the resistivity-related attribute. You have to still be passing the TOC. Now, if you find out that the TOC uh, fails, uh, let's just say it's three days before the uh, the the conductivity or resistivity fails, then you can probably set up by procedure a time to replace uh, those units, those modules in the system after so many hours of service or so many gallons of water or whatever have gone through the, the modules that are there so you can replace them before they fail uh, and replace them before the TLC fails. And that will be something that, that you'll have to struggle with to try to find out at what point that is. But that's something that would be needed uh, for the TOC attribute for these small units, benchtop units. All right, let's talk about packaged waters. Um, packaged waters are an issue. Uh, <clears throat> they're often used uh, by, by folks really sort of unwittingly uh, because they want to avoid uh, the cost of a water system, uh, because it might be cost associated with a facility renovation, or uh, perhaps the cost associated with designing the water system and then installing it, and then, of course, maintaining it, and then monitoring it, and then controlling it uh, through perhaps uh, adjusted maintenance programs. And then, of course, there is the big V word, you know, validation of that kind of water system. And so <clears throat> these people think, well, they can avoid those costs if I just use packaged waters. Well, that's an appropriate decision uh, in some cases, but we'll talk about all the things that, uh, that most people don't think about when they go that route. Now, the scenarios that might be driving the use of packaged waters could be maybe you just need a limited volume. You don't need much water for your operation. Uh, most of the water that you, that you have is, is, can be provided very adequately uh, by a, a bag or a box of water. Uh, and you don't need that much. Maybe because of the particular water use that you have, maybe you only need it for a short term, for a short period of time, uh, and then after that you don't need it. And so in that situation, perhaps uh, a packaged water situation might be appropriate. Uh, maybe you need higher purity than plain old ordinary purified water. 
maybe you need HPLC grade water or something like that uh, because you have one specific analysis that requires some amount of water to be added to a mobile phase or whatever and you don't need a whole water system when all you need is, is a few hundred cc's uh, of, of this high purity water and so maybe a packaged water situation makes a little sense. It also makes sense sometimes when there's at least a perception that uh, uh, that it's not really that important for the intended use. Maybe you're using the water for cleaning or maybe you're using it for API manufacturing where you don't really have to have purified water. Uh, you may not have to have microbial control because of noxious solvents are high or low pHs or high temperatures or whatever that are used in the process that would kill any bugs that would have gotten in um, in the water system during that API manufacturing process. So it could conceivably be justified. Um, maybe it's because you have a facility that's leased for a period of time and maybe like a lot of uh, 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 owners of, of buildings and landlords, they forbid you from uh, from modifying the walls and hanging when, hanging uh, pictures or whatever, uh, like you sometimes find in, in apartments and things like that, where where you're forbidden to actually renovate the facility because you'd have to renovate the facility to install a water system. And by the way, who's going to put that kind of money into a water system that you're just leasing for a finite period of time. Uh, and then when the lease is up, you're going to leave it behind. You know, chances are the landlord's not going to want to have a water system in there for the next uh, lessee to try to uh, have to deal with if they don't need a water system. Um, maybe your operation is small, uh, speculative, and maybe even potentially transient because Perhaps you are an early R&D company and uh, you have a good idea and a, and a certain complex or small molecule that you're trying out for the early clinical trials and you don't know if it's going to work or not, uh, and it's all very speculative, uh, you certainly aren't going to want to kick in lots of bucks into a water system uh, that you're going to abandon uh, shortly when, whenever your product fails fails to be effective or whatever, because you don't know if it's going to be effective in those early uh, clinical trial periods. Uh, all I can say is if you go with packaged waters for any of those reasons, be very careful. Uh, packaged waters are rarely as pure as the bulk waters. In fact, I'll go out on the limb. I'll say never as pure as the bulk waters uh, can be. Now, you can have impure bulk waters, you know, from delivered from a water system, but you can also have very pure bulk waters. You cannot have very pure packaged waters. They don't exist. Um, and that's because the packaging, the leachables from the packaging, uh, compromise that high purity water that may have been put into the package. Um, now, a lot of people are not aware uh, that in USP 34, and this happened in, uh, and it was official on May 1st, 2011, the packaged purified water and water for injection specs. Now, this is not the sterile purified water or sterile water for injection, but just the packaged waters. These are described actually within the monograph for purified water and water for injection. You can just package it without any kind of microbial control associated with it. You can just package it. But the chemical specifications for these waters, since they were used in the same application that the bulk waters are used for, have now been made to be identical to the bulk waters. So now the packaged purified water and water for injection specs have the same conductivity and TOC specifications as the bulk water. So it's the same stage one, two, three. Actually, for packaged water, it would only be stage two and three because you wouldn't have an online version of a packaged water. Um, but the TOC specification is the same, and that's the, that's the catch, because very often the package has extractables that could cause that TOC spec to fail. Uh, and if it's a glass package, it could cause the conductivity spec to fail as well, because of extractables coming, sodium and silicates and stuff coming out of, out of the glass uh, in, in the packaging. Um, so not all packaged water vendors are even aware of this change. And so if you are buying packaged waters today 
I mean, we're talking like the the plastic bag inside a cardboard box with a little spigot at the end, you know, those kinds of things. Those have to comply with the same specifications as the bulk waters, and they may not. So you probably need to verify to make sure they do and make sure that the vendor that is providing this bulk packaged waters for laboratory use, which is a very common approach, uh, make sure that they do meet the conductivity and TOC specifications of the bulk water that are in the purified water spec. Now, sterile waters, people think uh, that sterile water for injection or sterile purified water is going to be just that much better uh, because it's sterile. And as it turns out, the type of packaging that these things are put into and then sterilized in usually create very high TOCs. There is no way that most of these sterile packages, be it a vial or a bag or whatever, uh, can pass the bulk purified water specifications. Uh, and remember, that's what you have to pass. Uh, when you're using them in a laboratory. So be careful about using bagged waters, uh, thinking that they are even purer than the other waters. They more than likely are not, especially in the TOC. Uh, it's the packaging that is causing the leachables, that is reducing the quality of the water. Now, if it's plastic packaging, it's usually TOC that's leaching. If it's a glass packaging, it's usually the, the sodium and the silicate ions and other caustic ions that may be, be released from the glass itself that's causing a problem. So these leachables could have anywhere from no impact at all to a dramatic impact uh, on whatever you're using that water for. And right now, unless you try it out, you don't know whether it's going to have that kind of impact or not. And so that means if you happen to be using packaged waters to avoid this initial or ongoing water system cost, um, that means you need to verify that the quality of each batch, not just the vendor's item number, but each batch, because it can be variable from batch to batch, uh, meets the bulk purified water specifications. Now, if you get a C of A that just says pass or meets, uh, meets specification or meets USP specifications, you need to dig down, drill down, and find out what exactly they think means a pass. Because they may mean pass, meaning that the water I put into that bag or into that box met the specifications. They may not be talking about the water being delivered by the box. Um, so, you, you need to drill down and you need to find out what that C of A says uh, and what it means when it says that it passes. Uh, ideally, you should have a C of A that actually has some sort of numbers associated with it uh, rather than just pass or, or, or whatnot, because pass doesn't mean much, especially when, when the criteria are vaguely defined uh, as what's passing. Uh, that means that for every application that you use that packaged water for, you need to assess the impact of the leachables that are in that water. And for consistency purposes, you know, since every batch of that water could be different, remember these are attributes that they're probably not controlling. They're probably not controlling uh, the variability in the packaging uh, that could have higher or lower extractables from one batch of packaging uh, plastic to another. Uh, that means that every single batch probably also needs to be assessed. What this does with all this assessment of, of suitability is it adds cost. Um, so all this leachable impact evaluation that you're using uh, could actually neutralize whatever cost you're avoiding uh, by not having a, a, an onboard uh, system that actually generates the water. Uh, and so don't think that you're getting off light necessarily uh, by having packaged waters because you now have the obligation to prove that your packaging waters, your packaged waters are not causing your problems. So, uh, so there's a lot of hidden costs uh, associated with using packaged waters. So basically be very, very careful that you do assess the true cost of using packaged waters rather than having a bulk purified water system or a bench top type of system before you go down that route because uh, there are going to be costs in there that you probably didn't consider. All right, I have gotten to the end of this. 
and I am ready to take questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sully, for the wonderful presentation. Also, we'd like to thank all our participants for cooperating with us. Uh, it's time now for the Q&A to begin. Uh, all participants uh, who have questions can go ahead and click on the raise hand option, which is a small palm-like icon at the bottom of the participants panel. And I can unmute your lines, and uh, you can ask your questions verbally. Or you can go ahead and post your questions on the Q&A panel. Uh, if you are finding it difficult to use these two methods, you can go ahead and post your questions on my chat panel, your host, and I shall pass it on to our presenter to have it uh, answered. Now, in the meanwhile, uh, I do request all our participants to go ahead and share your feedback with us. The feedback form has about eight questions, mostly multiple choice in nature. It wouldn't take more than two minutes of your time to answer. The feedback form will appear on your polling panel right now. While we're waiting for some questions to come up, I uh, just wanted to go ahead and uh, inform all our participants. Uh, uh, we have uh, three more webinars uh, from Dr. Solly coming up this year. Uh, they are on your screen right now. We have um, a couple of them in the month of November and one on 5th of December. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would also like to inform all our participants that in case your team members, colleagues, friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it would be available in the recorded format and can be purchased from our website, or you can call us at our toll-free number 1-800-447-9407. Dr. Soli, I do see a question. Um, let me quickly go ahead and... Don, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question to Dr. Soli. Thank you, Dr. Soli. My question regards sending samples out to independent testing laboratories. We have a, a specification that the samples must be received within 24 hours of collection from our purification sources. And I was wondering what kind of degradation, if any, might cause a false passing result. Uh, if, if it exceeds that 24-hour specified time frame, um, it seems to me from a limited perspective, that it would only tend to give a, a, a higher constant or higher uh, reported result of contamination. But could you elaborate on that? Well, you know, it depends upon uh, what test you're you're having the laboratory do, because you have conductivity, okay. you've got uh, TOC, you've got uh, potentially micro, uh, you may have other specific attributes, maybe a cadmium test, or you know, goodness knows what. Um, Generally speaking, um, in 24 hours time frame, uh, nothing much is going to happen. Now, I'm going to qualify that with saying that that the TOC tests uh, are probably the most notorious uh, for giving you false positives, uh, and that has to do as much with the container that you use as anything uh, for collecting the sample. Uh, I strongly, strongly recommend that you use uh, some purchased certified low TOC container. Uh, very often they make these containers that are compatible with whatever um, instrument uh, auto sampler for TOC instrument auto samplers uh, exist, and uh, those are different diameter vials, you know, obviously depending upon uh, the brand of the instrument. Um, and that's a, a very strong recommendation. And the reason I say that is because it is very, very difficult uh, in a laboratory to get some of your conventional labware clean enough uh, to not actually contribute additional TOC to the water after you collect it. Um, and the reason that is important is because that's a time-related thing. Uh, as the water sits in the container, more and more of the TOC is released from the surface of the glass or, or plastic, whatever the container is. Um, and so you can actually get uh, a false high reading at the end of, of a storage period, even 24 hours, um, uh, if it's a TOC sample. Uh, you do sometimes have conductivity issues as well uh, if it's a glass container that's used for the conductivity. Some glasses uh, will leach uh, 
you know, some conductive ions and can affect uh, the conductivity of the sample. However, that usually is a very small effect, uh, and the only time you ever see that impact is if you have a very, very tight uh, specification that's tighter than, than the purified water spec. You know, for instance, if you have an ultra-pure water spec or something like that, uh, you can get enough leaching uh, of sodium uh, ions and silicate ions, you know, from the surface of the glass to actually fail your internal specification for, for conductivity for that water. Um, getting to micro, which might be one that you're talking about, um, uh, typically in a 24-hour period, if it's been refrigerated, you typically don't see much change. Uh, but if it ever is longer than that, you can actually see a, a fall, a drop in the counts as the organisms um, adsorb to the surface of the glass vial. Mm -hmm. um, usually the larger the sample size, which actually reduces the surface area to volume ratio, uh, the less likely you're going to see that, but the smaller the sample size, the smaller the container, the more likely you are to see that. So, uh, uh, so it's, uh, it is a phenomenon that could cause something to look better than it really was, you know, at the time you collected the sample. So you sure. could get a, quote, false negative uh, in that situation. Frankly, in a 24-hour period, especially if you refrigerate the samples uh, very shortly after collecting them and keep them refrigerated, not frozen, but refrigerated uh, on the way to the laboratory, there's not going to be much change um, uh, in the micro count. Um, and so you're going to see pretty, pretty close to, to what you actually had uh, in your original water sample. Now, endotoxin, I don't know if that's one of the ones that you send out as well. It but is. It's... it's Endotoxin straddles the fence of, of uniformly distributed and, and non-uniformly distributed because obviously it comes from bacterial cells. Um, uh, it can be coming uh, into your water distribution system from upstream, and so in that case it's usually soluble, uh, and so it behaves an awful lot like, like a chemical, and that means it's uniformly distributed throughout the water system. Um, but if it's uh, being generated by local biofilms uh, at the time that you collect the sample uh, or if you have a, a microbial count in there, uh, you can have localized biofilms uh, that create localized endotoxin. Uh, now typically in my experience you only see this impact because usually if you, the, the amount of organisms it takes to, to fail uh, the endotoxin test is an astronomically high number of organisms, you know. So, so the only time you ever see the impact of local endotoxin is when you have a very, very tight spec. If you have a spec that's like less than 0.03 or something like that, the very, very tight spec, not the 0.25 spec, but the very tight one. Uh, and the 0.03 is like the limit of a gel clot test. Um, you might actually might be able to see enough endotoxin from a local microbial count to be able to see a 0.03 response. And so you could get from endotoxin, uh, local endotoxin, an impact uh, from local bio, uh, biofilm organisms. Now, how would this change over time? Well, if it's coming from local organisms, like organisms that are in the sample that you actually collected, uh, if the organisms leave the water stream, leave the bulk water phase to go to the surface of the container, so will your endotoxin go away. So it'll follow along with it. In most cases, like I said, the endotoxin, if it's soluble, will behave more or less like any other chemical, like it were TOC or conductivity or anything else. Uh, in, in the water sample. However, I need to qualify that by saying that, that if you collect it in a plastic container, and sometimes people use pre-sterilized uh, polycarbonate or polystyrene containers or whatever uh, to collect these samples, these, these containers often are um, hydrophobic in nature, and so it is possible that, that when when endotoxin, which is soluble, soluble in water, it, but exists as micelles of perhaps a hundred molecules, all, all in sort of this bubble, you know, with the hydrophobic tails pointing to the inside, away from the water, and the hydro, hydrophilic heads I mean, all on the outside of this micelle. 
when they get into a, a hydrophobic walled container, sometimes those micelles can unfold and associate with the wall of the container. And uh, this, this happens usually with some sort of prolonged exposure, but basically what it does is it, it, it adsorbs out the endotoxin out of the sample. Uh, so be careful what kind of sample container you use. If you use glass, you don't see this. Uh, but if you use a plastic, you might see it. So, like I say, it very much depends upon the container that you're using uh, and the attribute that you're trying to assess uh, by a contract lab away from you. So, uh, so I didn't give you a nice, clean answer to your question, but uh, uh, like all good uh, consultants say, it depends. <laughs> so. um, is it defensible to say then, uh, getting back to just conductivity and TOC, that if, let's say, you exceed the uh, the time by, by three hours, it's 27 hours, but your results are good, that that they have not produced a, a false uh, passing result? Yeah, generally in, in the TOC and conductivity, only bad things happen to the sample. Uh, and so, so when you exceed that time limit, uh, most typically what happens is the level will, will have been higher uh, rather than lower uh, when you exceed the time period. So f uh, failing in the negative direction is something that uh, typically just doesn't happen with conductivity and TOC. Uh, if, it's going, if it's going to be worse with a prolonged exposure uh, or prolonged resonance time in the container, if anything, the levels will go up over time rather than down. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Solly. Thank you, John. So are there any more questions? Or maybe if you're not bold enough to verbally ask them, you can send them via chat uh, to Johnson, and I'll see them, and I and, uh, can answer those as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we still do have time for the question and answer session. Uh, as Dr. Solly mentioned, you can go ahead and use the Q&A panel or you can use the chat panel to ask your question. Okay, while we're waiting for some more questions, just wanted to go ahead and take our um, participants to another slide. Uh, this is uh, a slide where Dr. Solly is conducting two-day in-person seminars. Um, we have two locations, uh, one in Washington, D.C. on the 12th and 13th of February, and w the other location is uh, in, the, uh, in San Diego on 1st and 2nd of May. Uh, please feel free to log into our website, which is www.globalcompliancepanel.com to go ahead and make your registrations. I can tell you guys, if you want to participate in that, you're going to learn uh, just about everything you'll you'll need to know uh, about water. That's why it's called the A disease. Uh, anything to do with microbial control and validation and whatnot uh, of a water system will be covered in that course, including investigations and everything. So uh, I think the details are available on that, on that website. And you can look at the at the curriculum and and see if uh, it's going to be of interest to you. I'd love to see you there, uh, and I'd love for you to come up to me and say, "Hey, I listened to you on the such and such webinar, and I'm here because I want the full load." Uh, so you'll get the full load uh, during those two days. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Solly. Uh, Dr. Solly. Um we don't have any more questions. Any concluding remarks from your end before we close today's session? Uh, thanks, Johnson. Um, actually, all, all I'd like to do is thank you for uh, for participating. I do appreciate the good question that I got. Um, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to contact me through the uh, Global Compliance Panel website, uh, and I'm perfectly willing to answer short questions. Uh, uh, not litany questions like what do I need to know about validation? Uh, wouldn't answer those, but uh, but you know if you have specific issues uh, that you're wondering about, uh, feel free to to send me a question via Global Compliance Panel. 
Uh, I do appreciate your time today, and uh, uh, I know that you're busy people, uh, but I appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives and, and listening to me, and I hope that this was of some value to you. And maybe next time uh, you'll be able to participate in another webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sully. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful to all of you for having taken part in today's session. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email to webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com. We welcome your suggestions and feedback or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. Uh, if you'd like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training online or on-site, we ensure whatever your training necessity is, it would be our priority. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon and for your continued patronage. On behalf of our presenter, Dr. Terry C. Solly, and the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to say thank you for participating in today's webinar, and we wish you a pleasant day ahead.